As ruler of Cambodia, Pol Pot was responsible for killing nearly two million people. That's a quarter of the country's population. In his four-year reign, Pol Pot tortured and starved the Cambodians to death. Men, women, children and babies. He turned Cambodia into a killing field. When I first spoke with Pol Pot, he refused uh, to take responsibility uh, for an absolutely cataclysmic, catastrophic destruction of uh, innocent, uh, innocent people. No one, no one had a clue at um, how many people had been slaughtered and how many people had died, no one. On the 17th of April 1975, a guerrilla army known as the Khmer Rouge entered the Cambodian capital Phnom Penh, victors of a five-year war against a government backed by the Americans. The Khmer Rouge leader was a man most Cambodians had never heard of. When it was announced that Pol Pot, a rubber plantation worker, was the new prime minister, no one had ever heard that name. It wasn't until late 1978 when his picture began to appear in communal dining halls that his own brothers and sisters realized that it was their brother who was in charge of this government. Pol Pot was born in 1925 on a rice farm north of Phnom Penh in a Cambodia ruled by the French. At the age of six he was sent to the capital to train as a Buddhist monk but the boy from the village only felt like an outsider in the bustling modern city. He didn't have a sense of the multicultural nature of the Cambodian cities like Phnom Penh, which were mostly ethnic Chinese and Vietnamese. Or if he did have that sense, he resented it. When he visited Saigon, he said he felt like a dark monkey from the mountains. Cambodian's political culture is uh, steeped in uh, resentment towards uh, its neighbors and its uh, racial uh, neighbors. It's steeped in a deep feeling of, of being a lesser culture. Pol Pot in many ways was a reflection of all of these things. In 1949, Pol Pot went to Paris as a student. There, his innate racism would find expression in extreme communism. The years that Pol Pot was in Paris was probably the most uh, hardline Stalinist party in Western Europe, uh, a very rigid uh, doctrinaire party. The terrible things that happened under the Khmer Rouge between 1975 and 1979 uh, did indeed have a lot to do with ideology, but more to do with uh, racism, uh, with chauvinism, uh, with nationalism. Those were the driving forces and the driving ideologies behind what many call genocide. Pol Pot returned to a newly independent Cambodia in 1953 and joined the underground Communist Party. Outlawed by King Sihanouk's government, Pol Pot and his comrades fled to the countryside to wage a vicious guerrilla war. Even then, Pol Pot had his sights on ultimate power. Pol Pot was more likely than not responsible for the execution of his predecessor as leader of the Communist Party in 1962. He was a man who was able to uh, hold on to power while eliminating uh, any and all uh, opposition. Pol Pot's ruthless march to power was boosted in 1970 when the Vietnam War spilled over into Cambodia. Pursuing communist North Vietnamese troops across the border, the United States bombed huge areas of Cambodia, killing thousands of peasants in the process. This only increased support for Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge. There was this terrible mixture of historical events and uh, terrible Cambodian political realities which ended up with an orgy of uh, mass murder of which Pol Pot, uh, without any question, uh, was the architect. By April 1975, Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge were in the capital, Phnom Penh. When they 
achieve victory in April 75, they felt they were in a position to put in place and to carry out an extreme, uh, pure, total uh, revolution of a sort that was more extreme, more total, purer than any, any other revolution in history. When Pol Pot and his army arrived in Phnom Penh, they immediately evacuated the entire population into the countryside. In what would be known as Year Zero, Pol Pot began to destroy and rip up Cambodian society, reducing it to a state of primitive barbarity. It was very frantic, it was very chaotic, very scary. They just screamed and screamed into the bullhorn that said we had to leave. Two million Cambodians living in Phnom Penh were evacuated in 72 hours. It's the take the basket and dump it upside down theory. You broke up every organization that anybody ever had. They were cut from their family, they were cut from their friends, they were cut from their professions, everything. Believing the city people to be contaminated by their past lives, Pol Pot would rewrite their histories. Money was banned, the Buddhist religion outlawed, and the country's name changed to Kampuchea. Then he dispersed the city people to peasant villages throughout Cambodia, where they would grow rice and build dams for the revolution. Here, in this idealized peasant state, he would purify them through hard labor and brutality. They did regard the city population as enemies, but mixed with that was a strong ethnic belief that the peasants were the real Cambodians. We, we were from day one because of our skin color were targeted. Lighter skin meant that you were probably came from a more corrupt class. Darker skins were good because it meant you worked in the field. It meant you worked to grow rice to support the revolution. Little more than nameless, faceless slaves, the city people would literally be worked to death. You worked 12 to 16 to 18 hours, working in the field, growing rice, harvesting rice, building dams. There's a lot of people um, do a lot of harsh work. I mean, people work. They work you um, until you drop dead. The Khmer slogan that time was to keep you was no gain and to destroy you was no loss. So we knew that human life was cheap and that we, if we did not produce, we would be killed. Fear and the threat of arbitrary, casual death was everywhere. At one point I remember um, just working and then they just walk up and just shoot the person in the head. You know, the guy just walk up and go boom. In fact, most of Pol Pot's victims were killed not by bullets, but beaten to death with blunt instruments. We still didn't know who Pol Pot was. We didn't know what kind of a man he was. We didn't know what he looked like. And I remember just hearing all these accolades and praise about this mighty person, this strong person, this person who loved us, this person who wanted to bring our country back to its glory days. In Pol Pot's peasant utopia, starvation claimed most lives. The huge influx of city people into the rural areas meant there was not enough rice to feed them. Even the peasants themselves began to starve. And indeed, rice was withdrawn and exported by the party centre while these people were dying in massive numbers of starvation. Life wasn't even cheap to Pol Pot, it had no value at all. Even today, the exact number of mass graves into which the victims' bodies were thrown is not known. You know, Pol Pot was uh, a remarkable man. Uh, he was uh, generous, he was kind, he was uh, loving, almost grandfatherly. He had all of the characteristics of uh, a great leader. There are a lot of Cambodians who don't believe that what happened under Pol Pot in fact was his doing because he was too good a man. 
Pol Pot believes that what he did, he did for the good of his country. Few Westerners ever got to meet Pol Pot whilst he was in power. One who did was American journalist Elizabeth Becker, who interviewed him in 1978. What struck me first was that he was much more handsome and a charming smile. There was, there was some charm to the man. And um, we were told to sit down, put the cameras away, and we were to sit there and listen to Pol Pot. And when the, when the time was up, the time was up, and he said goodbye. With her was another journalist, Dick Dudman, and British academic Malcolm Caldwell. To Caldwell, he was more indulgent. He told Malcolm Caldwell how wonderful the, the communist experiment was in Cambodia. Totally, two totally different interviews. One was a lecture and the other was an interview. Later that night, back at their hotel, an unremarkable meeting with Pol Pot was about to turn into an unforgettable nightmare. A few hours later, I woke up because I could smell cordite, you know, the smell of um, a gun being fired. And then I heard shots on the second floor. Lots of shots. I didn't count them, but lots and lots of shots. And so I went upstairs, and um, Malcolm's body was on the floor, and, you know, white with death. The gunman walked in and murdered Malcolm. Why Malcolm? The friend, the one friend of the regime, and not us. Some documents suggest that it would have been me. Another one suggested that it was Caldwell. Why? We, we, it doesn't make any sense, but nothing makes sense there. Needless to say, after all that, I couldn't imagine how Cambodians lived through almost four years of that. I mean, what I went through in two weeks, they lived through four years and saw their whole lives, their whole country, everything destroyed. Within two years of Pol Pot coming to power, hundreds of thousands of Cambodians lay rotting in mass graves. Starvation, overwork and summary execution had all taken its toll on the city.